Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Allison Stein, author of the novel Trashlands. Allison's previous novel, Road Out of Winter, won the 2021 Philip K. Dick Award. Allison, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, Trashlands, how would you describe the novel? Well, uh, Trashlands is set in a world very similar to our own, only a generation or two in the future. And plastic is so common in this world that it's used as currency. I decided to set the book a generation or so after really kind of world-changing giant floods. And I thought, what would be left after the floods receded? And I realized, well, it, you know, it's something we have a lot of now, and that's plastic. So the book follows a young single mom named Coral who lives in this world and sorts through garbage and drags the river for plastic to sell. But she wants more for her life. Um, and it also follows not just her, but multiple characters in this community that they've made, you know, out of scrap and out of the leftovers of the world. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write Trashlands? I actually do. I, you know, I'm the kind of writer that gets a lot of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom would say I have too many ideas, you know, and sometimes it's hard to know what to focus on. But I feel like if you dream something, it's really important and you should pay attention to it. And I did dream Trashlands. I um, I was actually sleeping in an old school bus at the time. I'm a single mom and I don't get much time to just, you know, be alone and write. And so whenever I do get those rare days, I just try to go somewhere remote and just write as much as I can. So I had rented this old school bus that was being used as kind of a rental property. It was very rustic. There was no indoor plumbing. It's in the middle of nowhere. And I had a really hard time sleeping. And the first night, I just dreamed about this woman named Coral. And she lived in a school bus, which is probably why I dreamed it. But I knew so much about her in the dream. I knew that she wanted more than she had in her life. I knew she was a single mom, not totally by choice. I knew her son wasn't with her for some reason. And I knew that she was surrounded by junk, by plastic. And so I woke up and I thought, you know, what on earth was that? Why would this person live in plastic? And the story came from there. And is that the first story that you've written from a dream? Actually, it's not. That's a good question. Uh, my first novel, Road Out of Winter, I dreamed that too. Um, it, with Trashlands, I dreamed a character. But with Road Out of Winter, it was really an image. I had this weird image of a greenhouse, and it was nighttime. And the greenhouse was lit from within and warm and yellow, but it was surrounded by snow. And I knew there were two people and a child inside the greenhouse, but I also knew that the child wasn't their own or they weren't related in some way. Um, but this image kept haunting me. Um, and, you know, I just kept it in my mind for a while, I think for years. And then I was living in Ohio at the time. And if you're familiar with that part of the country, the weather can be very changeable. But um, we had a really late spring. You know, it snowed in May which was very unusual. And I thought, what if spring never comes back? And then I remember the greenhouse from my dream, and I kind of stitched the book together from that. So what was your writing journey that led you to writing your debut novel? Well, you know, I think like a lot of writers and artists, I've had kind of a, a meandering journey. You know, I've wandered mm -hmm. a bit. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a writer from when I was a small child. I wrote plays for a while because I, I did community theater in my small Ohio town, and I would write plays for them that they could put on and they didn't have to pay any royalties. So I was a, you know, a cheap hire. Um, and then when I got to college, you know, I had always written fiction. I'd always been trying to write novels. I always had a notebook, you know. But when I got to college, there weren't any fiction writers on staff, and there were only poets, and they really encouraged the poetry thing. So I did the poetry thing for a while and I published a few poetry books, but, you know, always in the back of my mind, you know, I've, I'm trying to write these novels. Um, Road Out of Winter is my first published novel, but it's mm -hmm. definitely not my first written one. I think it's like the seventh one that I wrote. 
and the first six are really bad, you know, <laughs> but it, it took me a while to realize, you know what, I'm not going to find a fiction teacher. I'm going to have to be my own teacher and books are going to have to be my teacher. I mean, I've always read novels obsessively. I love reading novels more than anything else. And I just realized that that's what I'm going to have to go on and I'm going to have to trust myself. And eventually I found the right story. And that was my first novel. And, and can you talk to us about that process? I mean, um, have you, have you sat and thought about or analyzed what were the issues for you in those first six, uh, drafts or, or first six novels that you had written and, and how did you kind of teach yourself? Well, you know, I think as sometimes happens, um, I had my breakthrough novel because I had given up, you know, because I was like, what do I have to lose? I might as well go for it. And I do think in previous novels that will never get published and are in a drawer, I do think I held myself back. I think I was worried about what people would think. And I think I was worried about being too much, you know. Um, writing with too many images or too passionately or having, you know, too much thinking in the book or too much violence, you know. Um, and I held myself back from what I really wanted to say. And then with Road Out of Winter, I was just so demoralized and frustrated. I felt like I was never going to get a novel out that I just decided to go for it, you know. And I wrote the most passionate, intense story and I didn't h hold myself back. And I didn't worry about what people would think until later. And then I realized, oh, no, people are going to read it. <laughs> but I think it made a difference. You know, I think I think you really have to go for it every time. So with your with your new novel, Trashlands, do you feel like you had to kind of go back to that space of of not worrying about what people would think? Definitely. And that that is a really hard space. Um, I wrote Trashlands. I think Road Out of Winter had been accepted, but it hadn't come out yet. So I was in a position of not knowing what that's like, you know, not knowing if people read it or not, not knowing if there's going to be reviews or not, you know, um, but it's still really hard to write as if nobody's going to read it, you know, to sing as if nobody's listening and you can just, you know, give it your all. Um, but the thing about Trashlands, which I think is the thing about really worthwhile stories is that you do lose themselves yourself in them. It, it may take a while to forget that noise, but eventually if you get into the story and you get into the characters, you know, Trashland swept me along and I really fell in love with these characters and I think of them as friends. And I was very sad when the book was over because I didn't want to leave them, you know? I love this community in a junkyard, this community out of scrap. And that really helped me shut out the worry about what people would think just because I love these characters and I wanted to see where they were going. Well, as I mentioned earlier, your debut novel road out of winter was a Philip K. Dick award winner. Um, and for those listening who may not be familiar, Philip K. Dick was a science fiction writer. Uh, his novel was the basis for the movie blade runner. And he was the author of many science fiction stories as well as novels. I'm curious for, for yourself, what's the appeal of science fiction for you as a writer? Well, I didn't really set out to write science fiction. I just mm -hmm. set out to tell this story. And hey, it turns out the story is kind of wild. And it's not set in our time, although I think it's certainly set in our world, just kind of tweaked and set in the future. Um, you know, but I think writers that haven't exactly fit into the mainstream, um, whether it's because of who they are, if they're uh, a queer writer, disabled like me, a writer of color, you know, sometimes science fiction has been a better home for us because it's a little more funky. You know, it's a little more strange. You're allowed to be more out there. And, you know, it's hard to break into the establishment, like serious literary fiction, if you're not the establishment, right? So I think sci-fi is a good home, you know, for misfits. And I've certainly always been drawn to those stories as a reader. Um, Angela Carter was a huge influence on me when I was younger. Uh, Octavia Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin were also really big influences, you know, and, and we want to write like our heroes. So I think I, I tried to follow their path a little bit, 
even though everybody's path is is going to be their own. How did you discover you won the award? Well, um, you know, we're in pandemic times, so it wasn't it wasn't a ceremony I could go to. Um, it was a it was a Zoom ceremony, and um, I was actually uh, at my parents' house at the time in a very tiny upstairs room, you know, the <laughs> guest bedroom, <laughs> trying to get the internet to work in the country. Um, so it was it was through a video, which is you know, which is exciting. I guess it's what we have now. So sure, yeah. Well. Trashlands has been described as climate fiction. What are your thoughts about that label? You know, I think it's an important label and I'm really honored to be in it. It was honestly not something I'd ever heard of before <laughs> Road Out of Winter came out. And then people started calling it that. And I thought, what is this? Uh, but also, you know, this is very cool and this seems uh, important. I mean, I... I come from a family of farmers, uh, small family farms on both sides, going back, you know, all the generations. Um, and so, you know, the earth is very important to me. I was taught very early on about plants and crops and taking care of the earth and foraging. Both of my grandfathers were foragers. Um, and so it's always been in my life. And so, of course, the fact that the earth is changing that we have done some things to change it and we need to, you know, start working on this, um, is going to, is going to be in there. It's going to be in my fiction because it's in my life. And although I certainly did not set out to, you know, provide a moral or teach a lesson, I just want to tell a good story. And this is the story that came to me in my dreams, but it does matter to me that the book matters too, and that someone might read it and maybe they will change their life, or maybe they will think about the earth differently, or maybe they will, you know, pay a little bit more attention to what might be going on. Um, I think that's the most that we can aspire to as creative writers. Hi, this is Jeff, the host of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I wanted to tell you about an app that can change how you plan parties and celebrations at your home. Drizzly. Drizzly is the most convenient way to buy beer, wine, and spirits with delivery to your doorstep in under 60 minutes. Are you hosting a book club party and you need a couple of bottles of wine? Well, keep in mind Drizzly. Or do you and your friends make cocktails based on your favorite book characters or novels? If so, again, use Drizzly. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. Drizzly is the number one app for alcohol delivery. Again, that's Drizzly, D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And right now, if you act, Drizzly is giving every new customer $5 off their first order. Just use the promo code FAST5 at checkout. Are you on a search for a special holiday a birthday gift? For a reader in your life? A reader who loves history? Well, I've got a suggestion for you. How about giving them weekly historic letters in the mail from Letter Joy? Every week, they'll receive a letter from a famous historical figure or an eloquent eyewitness to a major event. Past Letter Joy letters have included famous defense attorneys the United States and China, or working on the railroad, exploring the American history of the railroads. For example, one letter was an engineer writing home to his wife to describe the tough process of laying tracks for the Transcontinental Railroad. Every letter joy letter arrives at your door on fine stationery or parchment with a real stamp. And each letter also includes the postscript, an article by expert curators on the latest letter and the historical figures and events connected to it. Visit letterjoy.co to give weekly historic letters to the historian in your life. And I have a special offer for listeners of this podcast. Use promo code BOOKS at checkout to get $5 towards your first order. Again, that's letterjoy.co, 
promo code books to give a special gift to the reader in your life. Sure. Well, what was your writing process when you were working on Trashlands and your debut novel? Did do, Are you someone who outlines a novel extensively or do you just kind of dive into the narrative and try to figure out where it's leading you? I am actually not an outliner. I am a pantser, a fly by the seat of my pants. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think the reason for that is I like to be surprised. I'm a big horror movie fan. I will watch the most ridiculous B-horror movie. (laughs) And I think the reason is because they're surprising, you know? I mean, often it's bad surprising, but I want to be taken aback. I want to be shocked. I want to not know what's coming. And I think I feel that way as a writer, too. Uh, the hardest part I think of writing a novel is finishing the darn thing. And for me, it's hard to finish if I know exactly what's coming. So for me, I, I wait till I have an idea that I can't forget like those dreams or like a character that won't leave me alone or something that just keeps coming back to me. And then I decide to write. And usually when I get, you know, probably a third of the way through, I think I know where it's going to go. I think I know the ending. Um, and that helps me keep going too, but I really do like surprise. And that means of course, that my first drafts are very, very messy, you know, especially that first third where I didn't know what was going on and I was telling myself the story, but I like that too. I like going in there and that first draft with a red pen and really, um, unearthing the story, you know? So I like kind of finding my way as I go along. So are you working on a new novel now? I am. Yes, I am. Uh, It's set in Ohio, like all of my books. (laughs) And um, I think all I can say about it, it's pretty new, is that it it seems like it's not going to have this supernatural elements that my previous two have. But, you know, things are starting to get pretty spooky and and pretty dark. (laughs) So I'm excited about that. That's great. Well. Given your experiences with with uh, these two novels and getting them published and obviously, you know, writing them and all the revision that went in, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on your own stories and novels? Well, I, I do think that the hardest part of any project is finishing it, getting to that finish line at the beginning. Uh, so, you know, we give up on so many projects. We give up on so many novels. And I think it's just because, you know, we want it to be perfect, but being perfect takes time and you're not going to get that in a first draft. Um, when I was getting my PhD, I had a, a new baby and I was also a single mom, not by choice, just like Coral in my book, Trashlands. And my mom said something to me I'll never forget, which is done is better than perfect. So I think when it comes to getting our stories to that first draft, Mm -hmm. it's very true. Done is better than perfect. You know, get the story down and then you can work on making it better and getting it out there in the world. But the first thing is, you know, you got to tell yourself that story. Sure. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh gosh. Um, I am uh, reading a book of short stories called uh, Township, which comes out, I think, uh, in 2022, it's um, set in rural Ohio, like where I'm from and where it seems like all my stories are from. I guess we write about what we love. Um, <laughs> I'm also reading a novel called The Woodwife by Terry Windling. It's a reissue by Tor, um, which is pretty interesting because it's set in the West. So the landscape is very different than the landscape of my heart. And so I'm really enjoying that. Um what else have I been reading? I just finished a thriller called Fan Club by Aaron Mayer. I love thriller. I mean, you probably know this because I love horror, but I love scary <laughs> books. I love books that keep me up late at night. I love turning pages like way past when I'm supposed to go to sleep. Um, and so I love like mysteries and thriller books. And I try to, I try to take from those genres into my own. You know, I try to inject that kind of suspense. And, and like the book fan club, I think, um, I think as readers, we can be active readers too. And we can think, you know, what can I learn from this book? And that's something that I really love is to always be learning. That's great. 
Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your latest novel, Trashlands, and your earlier novel? Yeah, well, um, Trashlands and Road Out of Winter, uh, you can buy them wherever books are sold. We had kind of an exciting day on publication day for Trashlands because it actually sold out of several bookstores. It's never happened to me before, That's but it's wonderful. back in stock. You can get it <laughs> or you can ask your indie bookseller to order it too. Um, so you can find those anywhere. You can find me on Twitter at my name at Allison Stein. My name is spelled A-L-I-S-O-N-S-T-I-N-E. You can find me on Instagram at Allie Stein Writes, uh, write like a pin. And you can find me on my website too, which is just AllisonStein.com. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Allison Stein, author of the novel Trashlands. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy at your local independent bookstore. And Allison, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Trashlands by Allison Stein, read by Brittany Presley, available from Harper Audio wherever audiobooks are sold. Coral was pregnant then. She hid it well in a dress she had found in the road, sun-bleached and mud-dotted, only a little ripped. The dress billowed to her knees, over the tops of her boots. She was named for the wildflower which hadn't been seen since before her birth, and for ocean life, poisoned and gone. It was too dangerous to go to the beach anymore. You never knew when storms might come. Though they were going to get a whale. A boy had come from up north with a rumor. A whale had beached. Far off its course, but everything was off by then. The waterways, the paths to the ocean, its salt. You went where you had to go, where weather and work and family, but mostly weather, took you. The villagers around Lake Erie were carving the creature up, taking all the good meat and fat. The strainer in its mouth could be used for bows, the bones in its chest for tent poles or greenhouse beams. It was a lot of fuel for maybe nothing, a rumor spun by an out-of-breath boy. But there would be pickings along the road. And there was still gas, expensive but available. So the group went led by Mr. Fall. They brought kayaks, lashed to the top of the bus. But in the end, the water was shallow enough they could wade. They knew where to go because they could smell it. You got used to a lot of smells in the world. Rotten food, chemicals, even shit. But death? Death was hard to get used to. Masks up, Mr. Fall said. Some of the men in the group, all men except Coral, had respirators, painter's masks, or medical masks. Coral had a handkerchief of faded blue paisley knotted around her neck. She pulled it up over her nose. She had dotted it with lavender oil from a vial, carefully tipping out the little she had left. She breathed shallowly through fabric and flowers. Mr. Fall just had a t-shirt wound around his face. He could have gotten a better mask, Coral knew, but he was leading the crew. He saved the good things for the others. She was the only girl on the trip, and probably the youngest person. Maybe 15, she thought. Months ago, she had lain in the ice house with her teacher, a man who would not stay. He was old enough to have an old-fashioned name, Robert, to be called after people who had lived and died as they should. Old enough to know better, Mr. Fall had said. But what was better anymore? Everything was temporary. Robert touched her in the straw, the ice blocks sweltering around them. He let himself want her, or pretend to, for a few hours. She tried not to miss him. His hands that shook at her buttons, would shake in a fire or in a swell of flood water. Or maybe violence had killed him. She remembered it felt cool in the ice house, a relief from the outside where heat beat down. The last of the chillers sputtered out chemicals. 
The heat stayed trapped in people's shelters, like ghosts circling the ceiling. Heat haunted. It would never leave. News would stop for long stretches. The information that reached Scrapalacha would be written hastily on damp paper, across every scrawled inch. It was always old news. The whale would be picked over by the time they reached it. Mr. Fall led a practiced team. They would not bother Coral, were trained not to mess with anything except the mission. They parked the bus in an old lot, then descended through weeds to the beach. The stairs had washed away, and the beach, when they reached it, was not covered with dirt or rock as Coral had expected, but with a fine yellow grit, so bright it hurt to look at, a blankness stretching on. Take off your boots, Mr. Fall said. Coral looked at him, but the others were listening, knotting plastic laces around their necks, stuffing socks into pockets. <laughs>